Right. Uh, with no further ado, Jenny, would you like to kick off on your, your normal bit for me, please? Thank you. Hi, everybody. I hope you're doing really well. Um, so I'm just going to cover off what's been happening in with the mortgage space over the last few months for you. And I'm not going to take too long because I know you've got lots of other great speakers waiting to um, run through some bits and bobs with you. So what have we been seeing? So first of all, pricing. So the upward trend of pricing, I'll show the pricing is trending upwards, should I say, across lenders' core ranges. Um, what we've seen in the markets is that swap rates, which are the rates at which um, banks lend each other money, essentially has been going up. And that's because of concerns over base rate moving up, which in turn is largely linked to inflation and strong employment. Um, so lenders are borrowing money in at higher interest rates than they were previously, which means they're going to be passing that on to the actual borrower um, in, in as a matter of course. So what we're seeing is that lenders pricing is now increasing, but what lenders are doing is introducing what they call limited edition products. And we're seeing a real swathe of these at the moment. So what that is, is where a lender will say, okay, we're gonna lend you know, 10 million pounds or whatever that number is on this very, very good rate. When we get applications into the tune of that amount of money, we'll simply pull that product away from the market again. And these limited edition products are generally more competitive than the kind of core product range. So there's a product which I really, um, I really love this product actually at the moment. We're doing absolutely loads of applications on this because it works for so many landlords. Um, it's a five year fixed rate at 2.99%. It's with Paragon. Um, it has a flat arrangement fee of £2,000. It's available 75% loan to value. Now, on the face of it, a lot of you are going to be going, cool, 2.99, that feels really expensive. Um, but if I told you that it's available to individuals and limited companies, it's also available on blocks of flats of up to 20 self-contained units and HMOs of up to 20 rooms. So obviously for certain people, that product isn't gonna feel particularly competitive. But actually there's certain people and certain properties where that rate is really, really incredible. But like I say, it's all about limited edition products at the moment, limited distribution. Lenders really been able to manage their kind of pipeline and where their funding is going. Um, but the general trend of pricing is very much on an upward curve, I'm afraid now for you. In terms of criteria, what we're seeing is lenders definitely, um, I guess what they're doing at the moment is they're really looking at what they have to offer um, landlords and really reviewing how they can maybe broaden their criteria to kind of strengthen their position going into 2022. Um, we've certainly seen a notable increase in the numbers of lenders who are increasing their maximum loan to values to 80%. I think um, with the property market having done so well, but also real kind of predictions that it's going to stay strong in 2022 lenders are comfortable increasing their exposure in terms of loan to values and we've also interestingly seen some lenders remove their minimum income requirements so um, you may or may not know but lenders tend to sit in one of two camps to obtain a buy to debt mortgage they would either say that you have to earn an arbitrary figure of £25,000 a year irrespective of how much you're borrowing or they will simply say that we don't mind how much you're earning as long as you're earning something and so some of the larger institutions the Metro Bank and NatWest being two of them have removed that minimum income requirement over the last couple of weeks and it really is kind of I guess the question is well why are they doing this and I think really if you think about it an arbitrary figure of £25,000 a year income really doesn't mean anything and doesn't really add any value that figure has been the same figure since I've worked at mortgages for business which is 15 years ago um, so you know it's, it's it's a really crazy figure so I guess a lot of lenders are just looking at it thinking I don't really feel this adds any value to our lending proposition so let's just get rid of it and you know remove a layer of complication now, in terms of the lender's kind of view on next year, why they're really revisiting their lending criteria, I think the expectation is that 2022 is going to be a quieter year for the lenders. Um, so 2021 saw the highest number of purchase transactions since 2006, largely driven by the stamp duty holiday and also the um, pent up demand from Brexit and also people just really reconsidering their living arrangements after lockdown. Um, there's very much a prediction that you know, that's going to quieten down in 2022. And we've already started seeing the signs of that actually. So in quarter three this year, house purchases were 26% lower than in quarter two this year, but still 10% higher than the pre-pandemic quarter three of 2019. So while things are going to quieten down and have quietened down, they're still not back to pre-kind of COVID levels. Things are still up from there. Now, in terms of some predictions for next year, I'm just going to get my crystal ball out for you quickly. Um, we are expecting interest rates, particularly base rate, to go up. Um, it may even go up on Thursday of this week, um, but actually, um, 
we are expecting two base rate increases in 2022, expecting rates to settle there at about 0.75%. We are expecting house prices to continue to increase, albeit much more slowly than they have done. Um, we think the market is going to be underpinned by an improving labour market, but also then balanced off by the high inflation we have at the moment, which will be leading to some nerves as well. In terms of what our landlord clients are saying, um, a lot of them have been very quiet over the last couple of years in terms of investments, either not wanting to invest because of um, lockdown, the kinds of difficulties that that brought across to landlords, but also in the last year, the market has been so very, very busy. I think a lot of landlords just got switched off or turned off from the idea of buying, you know, and getting into bidding wars and gazumping we saw as well. But actually, there was a survey done recently across a large number of landlords, and 19% of those surveyed said that they were planning to buy another buy to let or at least one, maybe more, in 2022. So we are expecting the purchase market for landlords um, to kind of buck the trend and really, really improve. And that is everything that I've got to share with you today. Just a very brief update, which I hope was helpful. Thank you all for your time. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Jen. You've got one question. I don't know if you've seen. No. What's their loan? limits lower that doesn't make sense to me does it make any sense to you i can't see the question actually where's the chat you click on the chat box down the bottom should open it says what's their loans limit uh, lower please mark do you want to come on and um actually expand on that so this is from mark Connolly. sorry mark the the lower loan amounts that ends will accept is that what you were asking yeah so in terms of that uh, um, the uh, amount in terms of value of money. Yeah. Because a lot of lenders have a minimum that they'll lend because they want a good return as opposed to a mild one. Yeah. Unfortunately, I live in an area where I can buy very well, but it's always at a low value. Yeah. 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 So, so in... like, is 50 grand the lowest value or is 100 yeah so 50,000 um, pounds tend to be the minimum um, property value that lenders will accept in the limited company space if that's where you kind of operate um, there are lenders who can go at 50 but most of them said it's sort of 70 to 75,000 minimum property value but if you're buying personally um, then you can get away with 50,000 pounds as a minimum purchase price I don't think there's many lenders if any playing under 50,000 pounds at the moment I'm afraid Thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay, Mark. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Jenny. So, any more for any more with, with Jenny before we lose? I mean, Jenny, as usual, you're all more than welcome to to stay on and listen to all the other pearls of wisdom that are going to be here. I'd love to, but I've got a hot date with my chiropractor in a minute, so. <laughs> which I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> what, what I'll do is I'll send you the link for the recording, so you know if you want to catch up on it. Thank you. When you're feeling bored at midnight, you can do that. So, which will be very interesting. <laughs> Thanks, well, everybody. Thank you so much for that. Thanks. So, bye. We'll see you next time. So, Mark, if you like to unmute yourself, and uh, you know, if you want to come on, as I said, if you want to share screen, you can do because I've done it. Should have done it so you can share. Give it a go. So, away you go, Mark. Sure, yeah. perfect. Well, I've got the PowerPoint slide now, so I'll just uh, share my screen <laughs> and go through that. Thank you. Um, right, can everyone see that fine? Yeah, yeah we can. Away you Brilliant. go. Okay, thanks. Well, thanks a lot for having, having me, Peter. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about BOP, which is an open banking product for um, which uh, is for, for the payments market. Um, I'm especially uh, excited to talk to this audience because of my own experience, both as a landlord and as a tenant. Uh, so I know how just how relevant this new payments technology is to this sector. So I'll start off um, just giving you a bit of background on open banking. Um, so it's essentially a term, it's a global phenomenon, which is disrupting the financial services industry everywhere. Uh, sometimes it's regulatory driven, sometimes it's market driven uh, in the UK. It's regulatory and there is an open banking initiative which applies to uh, across Europe, um, but the UK is really is really making some strides there. Um, it essentially always refers to the term of the regulated sharing of bank account data, which gives rise to a number of products. So 
Bot is a payment product and we are able to facilitate payment requests because we are FCA regulated. You have to be in order to have an open have open banking uh, credentials. And you're most likely to have seen open banking when you log on to your banking app. So when you when you log on, you will see uh, that you can open up other bank accounts, even if they're not with the same provider. Um, that's one example. There are also two and a half million UK consumers who currently use uh, financial management apps where, and they use open banking derived data to do this. And we're certainly not the only ones in the space. Other names include WISE, Formula Transfer WISE, Revolut and Monzo. And the final statistic on this page is the is my favourite one because this shows the exponential growth that open banking has enjoyed uh, in the last two years. It's gone up by almost 90 times. Now, <clears throat> we've recently started talking to a large payment provider. I won't say the name of them, but you will have heard of them. And they absolutely realise that open banking is something they will have to adopt at some stage. It's just a question of when, given that their revenue is based on card payment fees. So what's driving this behaviour? Well, we've certainly seen a lot of change uh, in the world in the last decade or so, um, and especially uh, for unfortunate reasons in the, in the last couple of years. And we're certain because we all carry these high powered computers around with us, there is now less of a need for the for card technology, which is essentially plastic with numbers on them. So there is now the fact that we now have technology like biometrics readily available means that cards are no longer necessary in order to facilitate secure payments. We've seen the a significant decline in cash and of course QR codes are now very widely used and we're seeing the likes of Apple Pay, PayPal and Google Pay rising significantly in popularity. So what is BOP? So BOP is a way to, new way to pay and the most important part of this is that there are no cards involved. You can make a secure payment from account to account through an automated bank transfer without any details being shared or entered. This can happen through our app or our website button, but it always works through one of two ways, which is either scanning a QR code or clicking on a pay link. When the customer does that, it then gives them the option to open up their online banking, as you can see in the frontmost screen here. And you then choose your bank from a list and you're then guided to your online banking login where you can press pay. Now, the important thing here is that the customer does not need any app in order to make a payment. It's all browser based from their point of view. So how does BOP apply to landlords in particular? Well, previously, there's always been a choice between card payments and bank transfers. Now, neither are ideal. With card payments, there are contracts and associated fees. And then with bank transfers, there is an admin side of checking that you've been paid on time. And of course, um, reliance on the on the tenant or potential tenant to log in, enter the details correctly and pay. Now, this is so BOP is particularly useful for holding deposits. So I won't name them, but I do know of a large London, at least one large London estate agent who take holding deposits by asking for a bank transfer, then asking you to screenshot the proof, which isn't always possible because of security in banking apps, um, and then send that over to them. So this is problematic in a number of ways, the main one being that you have to constantly check this. Well, with BOP, you can just send that pay link from the app. It takes a few seconds. You enter, type the amount, and send it either by email or by text. And when they paid it, you can check the payment status. There is also a dashboard so that you can download your so you can download the details of the payments that have been made. And pay links, if you also want to send something a bit more uh, formal, such as a reminder of late rent, you can send an invoice like the one you can see here with a, a pay link on on there. And you could also put a QR code on there if it's a paper invoice. It's making it that bit easier 
for your tenants to pay. Another use is that it is found in the fact that our pay links can be used multiple times if configured such a, in such a way. So you can quite simply, um, so if whilst the ideal scenario is that tenants set up a standing order, it's not always the case. So you can send the pay link out for the monthly rent and they can, and then you can always check when it's been paid. Funds clear instantly and there is a transaction cap of 50 pence per, tra uh, per transaction. So um, this works for anything above £100 that's charged as if it were um, £100. So that's most payments to landlords. This shows you our pay-as-you-go plan and how it compares to the competition. So I've put a few, so the turnover in each of these three tables is exactly the same. The one thing that does change is the transaction value because that makes a difference to the, the maximum, uh, the, the transaction fee. So you can see here, so for anything over, so when it's, uh, so the bottom payment is um, amount of 70 pounds, you can see payment is significant, but then when you go up to above 100 pounds to 200 in this instance, the and then again when the payments are the transaction values are a thousand pounds you can see significant savings made there now you can also see here the uh, the discount code that you receive for being an ihouse member so the the code ms10 zsk entitles you to 10 percent off fees for lifetime now, please note that this is a completely pay-as-you-go service with no contract at all. So signing up for this service means that you simply give yourself the ability and having the app on the phone means that you have the ability to use BOP when you want. But if you don't want to, that's fine. There's no contract and it's completely risk-free. You can register on this link here. As I mentioned, there are no setup fees, no cancellation fees, no monthly contract. Uh, and you actually get uh, the first 30 days completely free anyway, because we're confident in our technology and we make it easy for you to join and to leave as well. So these are my contact details. Thank you so much for listening. Please do take them down. Um, more than happy to answer any questions that you may have, um, as I can also answer any questions as I can right now. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. Right, thank you, Mark. Um, got one question there. Yeah. Basically, I don't know if you've seen it. If you use automated bank transfer, what happens if you lose your phone or it breaks? Well, presumably you just use a different, <laughs> some some kind of different mobile device. So That's right, yeah, because it can be done from, it doesn't have to be done from a phone. You can also, uh, as a payer, you can make the payment from a desktop as well. But the crucial thing here is that it's different. It's it moves away from card technology um, in that it's not giving the payer permission to take money from your account as and when they want. And that's a big flaw with card payments and the reason why there are now so many so many um, implementations for security around it, such as strong customer authentication um, with open banking or it's it's a request service. So you request to pay. And then you, the customer then has the option to respond to that. So it's less of an issue if equipment is lost as it is with card payments. Okay. So if, if, um, if I'm just going to put you on mute up there. So hang on. So sorry. Um, so if, so as an example, you're, you're my landlord, I'm your tenant, I've not paid, you would send me a reminder with a QR code in it. Yeah. A QR code or a pay link. Okay, and I click on that or scan the QR code, and it will go. It'll open up something which enables me to pay through my bank account. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, so it's great for if you want everything in one place. So, for example, if you want to send a send a deposit um, with the prescribed information yep. and everything that goes with it, you can have that all in one email, so they can just pay it. Click every and check every and go through everything there in the one email, and it's easy for you to track them as well. Okay, all right. Any more questions from anybody? So we will put details out at a later stage. So, uh, so Mark, um, what we'll do is we'll get together 
later on, either later on today or tomorrow morning, we'll, we'll put some stuff out uh, yeah. for members so you know, they, they'll know how to start using it. So any more questions from anybody? No? All right. OK. Mark, thank you so much for that. I think you've, you've bamboozled them. So um, I'm, what I'm going to do now, if, it's, if you could just put yourself on mute again, I'd be very sure. grateful. So, right. Thanks a lot, Peter. OK, we're gonna, then going to hand over for taxation. So, right, OK. And I'll kick, kick off. Do, do, the, do the introduction to yesterday, do it all over again. So okay. I'll put myself on mute, uh, but I still will be here. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anhar Ali. I am uh, one of the relationship managers at Shipless Tax. Uh, the firm, the head office is based in Sheffield. We have a covering in Manchester, Birmingham, and uh, London. My colleagues mostly they've covered uh, and worked in London, so they deal with national and international clients and I look after them at the background. The company has about, you can classify it as few departments, chartered tax advisors where they structure and design tax systems. Sean is a tax uh, inspector for HMRC, ex HMRC. Um, the, he has a, a, another colleagues deal with tax investigation matters. They also deal with tax uh, disclosures. In fact, worldwide tax disclosures, Sean, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yes, and uh, um, there is, um, uh, we have our own legal, in-house legal team. They range from solicitors to barristers and QCs. They also have um, accountancy section for selected customers. And we also deal with, um, insolvencies as well. We have the capability. We also have the uh, facilities to deal with capital allowance in RD. There are separate people for, 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 for those. Uh, the colleagues um, are experienced as chartered tax advisors, ex-HMRC experience of substantial years. Um, there are fellows of accountants uh, working in the firm and legal practitioners as well. So there are junior and senior uh, level staffs. Sean will uh, is one of the senior colleagues in our company. Uh, he will be doing the presentation initially, and then they will be taking question and answers. Just keep that simple, if that's okay. Okay, thank you very much. So, Sean, over to you. And I'm, I'm going to put you on mute again, so he didn't come back on. So, okay, thank you very much for that. Thanks for that. So way background, I'm an ex-inspector of taxes, a tax inspector for about 10 years. Um, I left HMRC or Inland Revenue as was, and joined Moores Rowland, got taken over by BDO, ended up in Ernst & Young for 10 years. Uh, my specialism is in investigation work, um, and most of the investigation work I deal with at the moment, generally speaking, involves property. Um, HMRC are very hot on property at the moment, uh, simply because it's an easy kill for them in relation to the tax changes at the moment. Um, obviously, you can no longer claim interest as a, a full relief, you just get it as a deduction. In the past, they've abolished the wear and tear allowance. Um, back in the day, um, they had uh, the Let Property campaign was introduced in 2013. And at the time, they reckoned that roughly speaking, about 1.5 million landlords in the country and they estimated that probably only about half a million were actually declaring the tax. So there was a shortfall of almost 900,000 people who weren't declaring um, their rental income. Back in 2013, when we were doing rental disclosures, generally speaking, there wasn't that much tax at stake. Uh, historically, interest rates were a lot higher back then. And generally speaking, there'll be a little bit of tax, but generally speaking, the the mortgage payments or the interest on the mortgage would more or less equal the rental and therefore there wasn't that much tax at stake. Uh, but nowadays it, it's completely changed because you can no longer claim all the relief you could do. Um, it's quite profitable for HMRC to pursue people um, for the rentals. They're sending out what they call nudge letters. Uh, so nudge letters, you'll just receive a letter in the post basically stating, you know, we think you've got undisclosed rental income. Had a client recently, um, had a nudge letter, had one rental property in Hull, ended up with a liability, we haven't agreed it as yet, it's going to be between 10 and 15,000. Got another one, uh, again, the disclosure's only just gone in, but it's a partnership and they've got multiple properties and the liability, the overall liability is up, we're in the half a million uh, category. 
Um, the reason we haven't heard anything from HMRC is probably because it's not going to be dealt by the letting campaign. It's going to go higher up the chain and be dealt with by um, serious fraud office effectively. Um, so HMRC are all over the property. Why they're all over the property is quite simple because they've got a computer system that got introduced back in 2010 called Connect. Um, if you've ever heard of it, it basically connects all the information HMRC have got and then links it in to uh, undertake a risk review. So obviously HMRC have got a lot of information in relation to rental properties because obviously the land registry, they effectively run it anyway. So it's not particularly rocket science if Mr. Smith has got six properties and Mr. Smith's tax return has got no income from property being disclosed on it. It's, it's an easy kill for HMRC. They've got significant sources of information for Connect. So they've obviously got all the tax returns you've ever submitted. You know, they, they've got information in relation to your tenants if, they were, if they're claiming any sort of benefits. Uh, they've got access to Google. They've got council tax records, uh, dep uh, deposit protection scheme. There's a shed load of information HMRC can get. It's basically, though, they're just, as it stands at the moment, they're risk assessing it and going for the high, high level risk because they can, they're obviously resource constrained and therefore they're going to limit who they're actually going to target at the moment. But as soon as they you know, work through the, the, the worst offenders, they'll be down on other people and um, looking for them effectively. Um, and it, like I say, it's not rocket science if they can see from a company's house, sorry, from land registry, that these people have got property land disclosed it. It's quite an easy kill. Um, I don't really know what you wish to go on about in relation to the Let Property campaign. It's effectively a process whereby um, an individual who hasn't previously disclosed their, their rental income can make a voluntary disclosure to HMRC. It's effectively they make a, an electronic outline disclosure, basically stating they want to make a disclosure. And then they've got three months in with which to put the figures into it. Now, the figures are HMRC are only interested in what the rental profit is and what the tax due on it. So it's quite a simple process in relation to making the disclosure. And you've got three months from making the outline disclosure to submit the disclosure and effectively pay the tax. Um, you can get HMRC to agree a longer term payment in relation to the tax, but it's first off, it's just getting the tax position correct. In my experience, if you're... Um, a, a landlord and you've got one or two properties and effectively your only source of income is PAYE, HMRC aren't overly interested in the rental disclosure. Um, they tend to put it through on the nod. Um, it's very rare that they challenge it. They occasionally look at what the interest rate's been charged or the penalty that's been applicable. But other than that, I've never had a challenge and I've done you know 50 plus of these disclosures and never had a challenge when someone's just on PAYE income. They've always just accepted the figures. It's not quite the same if someone's a self-employed individual because then they've got more scope in relation to if they perceive that they've done something wrong with their rental, then they sometimes look at their self-employed income as well. So it's not quite as easy for a self-employed individual as it is someone who's on PAYE. Um, but like I said at the start, HMRC are thinking this is being fairly profitable simply because you know, interest rates are so low um, you can no longer claim the wear and tear allowance um, and it makes a huge difference of level, the amount of profit being achieved and the tax is going to be due. Therefore, HMRC are effectively all over property. Um, I've got a couple of cases, for example, I deal with cases of suspected serious fraud and I probably, you don't have many of these cases. I've only probably got about four working at the moment, but of all four, there's always, there's always a property, there's a purchase of a property or a sale of a property behind the reason HMRC have picked these up for inquiry. Um, the let property campaign, by going down that process, you get a lot better penalty um, scenario than if you did, if HMRC came nudging, uh, sent you a, a nudge letter or came knocking on your door, uh, the penalty can be a lot higher. So the let property campaign is uh, an opportunity for someone who hasn't previously disclosed to effectively come clean and um, at the end of it, walk away with, with you know, obviously having to pay a little bit of tax, but that's the end of the matter. There's nothing nothing further further to do. Um, I was going to discuss a little bit in capital allowances, but in relation to residential property owners, there's not a huge amount you can claim in relation to uh, capital allowances. You've obviously got the replacement allowance that got introduced a few years ago that effectively uh, supersedes the capital allowances. 
Um, it's also most rental residential landlords will drop their accounts what's called a cash basis, i.e. income received and expenses incurred in that period. And if you're drawing up accounts on the cash basis, you can't effectively draw up capital allowances. Uh, sorry, you can't claim capital allowances. Um, commercial capital allowances, they're, they're quite bespoke and it's fairly specialist. And uh, to be totally honest, it's, it's beyond, my, uh, beyond my knowledge in relation, if you wanted to be bespoke advice, that you could speak to one of my other colleagues. Um, that's not my, that's my, my, my background. So my background is just in relation to investigation work. Um, I'm open to any questions. If anyone wants to have a discussion or want to just chat, whatever works. I'm not, this is my first Zoom uh, presentation, so I'm not, I'm not particularly used to it, to be fair. No, that's fine. That's OK. Thanks very much for that, Sean. I mean, the interesting thing is I've got a, a colleague who is a, is a tax inspector um, and he says, you know, there's a couple of things he said, which is that um, a few years ago, I think it was Osborne, actually, who was then the chancellor, basically said rather than introducing new taxes, he would quite like the, the tax inspectors to collect the ones they're supposed to collect. So, you know, that would, much. that would fill a lot of coffers, quite honestly. So, you know, that's interesting. The other thing is, I'd, I'd like your comments on this one, is that um, they choose a particular sector to concentrate on. A, a few years ago, it's taxi drivers. They seem to be concentrating on landlords at the moment. Are you finding this? Yeah, I, like I say, all the investigation cases I'm dealing with at the moment, and I've probably got about 30 on the go, I'd say at least 25 of them have got property behind them. Yeah, it's either been a sale acquisition or it's a, a let property campaign disclosure. Um, so all of them have got they, there's a connection with the property, and quite often it'd be an individual who's bought a high value. So for example, I've got a, a client who recently he bought a property for 1.2 million. Um, he's he runs a, a shop, and he discloses probably about 10 ten thousand pounds a year. That, that's fairly standard. I've got another one, bought probably 750,000, declaring sort of 12, 15,000 a year. Uh, and that's it. And HMRC are just joining up the dots and saying, well, yeah, who on earth is going to lend you a mortgage? Or if you're disclosing 12 grand of income, how are you going to get a mortgage for half a million? Yeah. They do. They do get the mortgages. But, you know, it's, it's how can they then afford to pay the mortgages? It just doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. And are they still... Um... So if there's unpaid uh, tax of X pounds, are they still giving a, a fine of X pounds as well? So in other words, Yeah, yeah. So, so effectively, the, the penalty, if it's, if it's UK-based source income, the penalty would be up to 100% of the tax due. Yeah. It's never that high. It's, it's, based, it's based down on then um, yeah, how the HMRC perceives your, uh, whether, whether you've done it deliberately or whether you've done it deliberately concealed with just an innocent error. So, for example, if you've got um, you know, someone who's in, uh, been given a property and they inherit, inherited it and they just you know, already had sitting tenants in there and they just muddled on and whatever, you probably get away with a very low penalty. If you've got someone who's effectively you know, got a significant property portfolio and never disclosed a penny in, the, in their life, then they're going to be looking at a lot higher penalty. Yeah. Back in the day, um, your penalties, you could argue them down and you would end up with a sort of 10, 20 percent penalty of the tax due. But now it's uh, effectively HMRC. Uh, they, they're, they're stuck where they've got a, they, there's now legislation in place. So they can't go below certain amounts. So if your action is deliberate, it's going to be between sort of 30 and 70 percent and so on. And it's deliberate concealed. It goes up to 100 um, percent. So it depends how they perceive your actions as being. So but there, there will be a penalty at the end of the day, plus interest on any tax due. Right. So trying to swindle uh, the tax man is not a good idea. It's not a particularly good idea because it's not, it, it, they, they've got all the information. So it's, it's, it is only a matter of time before they catch up with you. It's simply they're, re, they're resource constrained and they can't attack everyone at the moment. At the, at the, you know, one person who's got one property and disclosed anything for a number of years will probably get it away for it for quite a while. But someone who's got multiple properties, sooner or later, something's going to be a trigger and HMRC will be all over it. I, I have to say as well, seeing how they're working at the moment, they're still... 90 percent working from home and they're not working at all well i mean there's a bit in the paper the other day that said the productivity is about 50 percent of what it should be it is absolutely dreadful at the moment if you try and phone hmrc you're probably not going to get through um i've, I've phoned them up and chasing things and effectively they one time when i phoned up they said they're not even opening the post they're 12 weeks but they at the time they were 12 weeks behind with their post i've, I've got a case 
um, believe it or not, it's a, a, a serious case. The guy sold a piece of land for 30, 30 million. He only bought it for 5 million and um, he, he only showed a profit of 2 million. I'm not sure how, how it works out, but we made the disclosure back in August 2020. And I had, I've literally last week was chasing the inspector for response and it's, you know, it's 14 months on and there's a significant amount of tax at stake and they haven't done anything. His only excuse was it was an oversight on his part. Right. Um, and I've, got, I've got other cases which in January 2020 they haven't touched since 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 then sort of thing. It's yeah, but other cases I've got and the HMRC are all over it. So it, I think it depends on the individual inspectors. If right. uh, they they were doing a lot of work in relation to giving out COVID grants and so on, and and the issue with I think when they were processing tax returns and CIS repayments, if anyone claimed a grant, they then had to do it manually. So every every claim for repayment was dealt with manually. Therefore, they, all their resources were devoted to giving COVID grants and so on. So they got an excuse for being delayed, but I think they they're, they're taking the mick a little bit now. I'd say. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, anything. Uh, I know conveyancing is is held up, even though ninety five percent of it's uh, online. Yeah. I know people have been trying to buy property. Everything's held up. Um, and it's oh we're, we're all working from home. Well, well, I'm pretty sure I saw an email a couple of days ago, basically saying HMRC aren't going to answer the phone on several days so they can catch up. Right, and something like that. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know it's a different world. Uh, we're not getting any questions in. Um, we got any questions for anybody? That uh, while you got Sean here, or you too frightened to stick your head above the parapet in case he writes down your name and address <laughs> and your NI number. <laughs> <laughs> no, no nothing from anybody there so um okay well i think that, that that's pretty much it sean so thank you so much for that no problem we're very much appreciated okay so yeah, thank you. Uh, questions well uh, i see we've still got sean on there and, and Hazo. so thank you both for joining us live tonight and uh yeah it'll all go from there so okay many thanks and uh goodbye from me and goodbye from everybody else so bye from now